Welcome to lecture two of this week. In this lecture, we will talk about some properties of the supremum and infimum operations. Well, actually, I will only talk about the supremum case. The case of infimum is almost the same, except the inequality symbol all go the opposite way. So if you understood the supremum case well, you will be able to also apply the knowledge to the infimum case too. To start with, we will talk about how the supremum, the maximum, and more general upper bounds are all related to each other. The first concepts that I'd like you to recall from our discussion last week on maximum versus upper bounds are that of intrinsic versus extrinsic statements. The definition of maximum is intrinsic. The statement itself, namely, that an element of a set S is the maximum if it is bigger than all other elements of S is a statement that only concerns the elements of S. The definitions of upper bounds and supremum are, on the other hand, extrinsic. The definition of an upper bound, being any real number that is at least as large as any element of S, is a statement about comparing numbers that are possibly outside of S against those in S. And the definition of supremum, which not only incorporates the notion of upper bounds, also talk about comparing different upper bounds and finding the smallest one. So this also involves comparing numbers that are outside of the set S against other numbers that may be outside of the set S. It is important to keep this distinction in mind when you think through today's lecture and do the associated exercises. Because when talking about intrinsic statements, you have more restricted scope and fewer possibilities. While at the extrinsic statements, you get a wider range of possibilities, both to satisfy a statement and to falsify a statement. Now, let's launch into the basic relationships between the three concepts. We start simple. By definition, a supremum is a special kind of upper bound. So in the Venn diagram of these three things, you see that a supremum can be included as one of upper bounds. And in contrast, a general upper bound is not a supremum. If it were, there would be no need to isolate the concept of supremum as a special one. Here, we have three more statements concerning membership in S. First, a maximum has to be an element of the set S. This is part of its intrinsic definition. Remember, maxima are defined only in consideration of elements of the set S, and the maximum must be an element. Second, a supremum may or may not be an element of the set S. This we will justify in the next slide. And finally, an upper bound that is not the supremum must not be an element of the set S. In other words, the only time when an upper bound can be an element of the set S is when it is the supremum. We will justify this in the slide after next. Let's first give some examples showing that a supremum may both be in the set S or outside the set S. For our example, we will look at two types of intervals. The first one is the interval from 0 to 1, closed at 0, and open at 1. I claim that its supremum is 1. Since every element of 0, 1 is no more than 1, we see that 1 has to be an upper bound. To show that 1 is the smallest upper bound, we need to show that given any other t less than 1, t may or may not be in the set, we can find an element of 0, 1 that is bigger than t. This rules out the numbers less than 1 from being upper bounds, and hence establish 1 as the smallest upper bound. To do so, we will appear to the Archimedean property. Given real numbers t and 1, we can find a rational number strictly between t and 1. On the slide, I give a bit more details on how to find this rational number. This rational number being strictly less than 1 and non-negative 
Notice that the number is 1 minus 1 over n for some natural number n, and hence is no less than 0. This rational number, being strictly less than 1 and non-negative, is an element of 0, 1. But it is bigger than t, so we see that t cannot be an upper bound. Finally, we see that by definition, 1 is not an element of 0, uh, 0 1, open at 1. For our second example, we look at the interval from 0, 1 closed at both ends. Exactly the same proof, proof uh, as for the first example can be used to show that 1 is the supremum of this interval. However, our interval now includes 1 as an element. So we see that supremum of a set may both be in a set or outside of the set, depending on which set you're, you're considering. Next, we justify the claim that an upper bound of a set S that is not the supremum of S must not be an element of the set S. So suppose Y is one such upper bound. By definition, supremum of S is less than Y, since sup of S is the smallest upper bound. And since sup S is an upper bound, every element of S is smaller than or equal to sup s. But by transitivity of the inequality, this means that every element of s is strictly less than y. Here the strictly comes from the fact that sup of s is strictly less than y. I want to caution you that strict inequality and less than or equal have uh, to have distinct meanings. You need to be prepared when preparing your work to justify why you use one rather than the other. Returning to our proof, if any element s is strictly less than y, then it is not possible for s to equal y. This means that y cannot be an element of the set s, as we have claimed. Here are two more relations. This concern the precise relation between the maximum and the supremum. The first statement says that if a set has a maximum, then the maximum is the supremum. The second statement says that if the supremum of the set can be found within the set, then that supremum is also the maximum. Notice that among real numbers, by the least upper bound property, we are always guaranteed the existence of the supremum if the set is bounded above. So another way to think about these two statements is that, first, the supremum always exists for sets that are bounded above. If the set were not bounded above, then neither the supremum nor the maximum exist. And so there can be no relationship between things that don't exist. Then, if the supremum were inside the set, then congratulations, the supremum is also the maximum, and you've just found the maximum of the set. On the other hand, if the supremum were outside the set, then you have just shown that your set does not have a maximum. If you go back to the examples two slides ago, where we talked about two intervals, both starting at 0 and ending at 1, but one uh, has the interval open at 1, and the second interval has it closed at 1, we see exactly that in the, in the open case, the supremum is outside of 0, 1, and hence the, inter uh, the interval has no maximum. While for the closed case, the supremum is in the interval 0, 1, and the number 1 is indeed the maximum for the interval 0, 1. That example is a very instructive example to keep in mind when you try to figure out the difference between sup and max. Let's prove the first statement, that, is the max, that, that the maximum is a supremum. The proof is just pushing definitions around. First, the maximum has to be an upper bound, since every element of the set is no greater than the, the maximum. Second, there cannot be a smaller upper bound. This is because by, we know, by definition, the maximum is an element of the set. So if a number is less than the maximum, it is less than at least one element of the set disqualifying it from being an upper bound. In this slide, we prove the reverse assertion that if a supremum happens to be belong to a set, 
then it is the maximum of Z set. But this is essentially by definition. If you revisit the definition of a maximum, it pretty much literally says that an element is the maximum of the set if it is an upper bound for the set that lives within the set. At this point, you're encouraged to pause the video, close your eyes, and first see if you can recall the relationships that we just explained between soup, max, and general upper bounds. Next, you should see if you can formulate what the correct analog relationships between inf, min, and general lower bounds. And finally, you should see if you can prove those analogous relationships, similarly to how the relationships for soup, max, and general upper bounds were just demonstrated. Here are some other properties involving the supremum and the infimum. First is a somewhat obvious proposition that compares the soup and inf of the same set. It says that if S is a non-empty set, then soup S is bigger than or equal to inf S. To prove this proposition, first we use the fact that S is non-empty to locate an element S. This, is, this step is where we use the property that S is non-empty. By definition, the supremum has to be at least as big as the element we located. And by definition, the infimum has to be no bigger than the element we located. So using the transitivity of the less than or equal to ordering, we find that inf S is less than or equal to S, which is less than or equal to sup S, proving the desired conclusion. Next is a proposition that compares the soup and inf of two sets. I'll let you read the statement of the proposition yourselves, but the hypothesis says basically that every element of S is less than or equal to every element of T. In other words, if you draw green dots on the number line to correspond to elements of S and white dots on the line to correspond to elements of T, all green dots should uh, show to the left of all white dots. Under this assumption, the proposition says that the supremum of S is no bigger than the infimum of T. Again, this is sort of obvious. We are reminded that the least upper bound is almost the maximum of S. If S is the maximum, then sup S is the maximum. But if S does not have a maximum, then sup S is the next best thing. Anyway, if the elements of S are all less than that of T, we would expect that the biggest you can get in S to be the smallest, to be smaller, than the smallest you can get in T. Now let's give the proof. It is a bit convoluted and requires using the definition of infimum and supremum twice. First, by our assumption, every element of T is bigger than every element of S. So every element of T by definition functions as a upper bound for the set S. This means, that soup of S is less than or equal to any element of T. This is because that T is an upper bound of S, and soup S is the least upper bound, so by definition, soup S is no bigger than any upper bound of which T is 1. Now, because soup S is less than or equal to any element of T, soup S itself satisfies the condition of being a lower bound of T. So, in turn, sup s cannot be bigger than inf t since inf t is the biggest lower bound. And that's it. The logic of this proof takes a few turns, so you might want to pause this video here and read through this proof a few more times to make sure you see what's going on. And that's it for this lecture. See you next time.